Black History Month. Why? It should not only happen in February, but 365 days of the year. Matthew DaCosta, first man of African heritage to visit and live in what is now known as Canada. Many sacrifices were made in wartime by soldiers of African descent as far back as the War of 1812. African people were once enslaved against their will and many fought enslavement. One hero was Harriet Tubman, who in the 18th century secretly led many enslaved through the Underground Railroad. So many black Canadians have contributed. Here are three to start our conversation. An inventor, a trailblazer, an advocate. Elijah McCoy invented an oil drip cup for the lubrication of steam engines. It was patented in 1872. He has 57 U.S. patents for his real McCoy system. How many train routes run through Canada? Via rail, 497 trains over 19 routes per week. CNR, CPR, 20,000 route miles of track over three coasts. Viola Desmond. Why is she on our $10 bill? In 1946, she refused to leave the whites-only section in the Roseland Theater. She was convicted of minor tax violation. This racial discrimination started the modern civil rights movement in Canada. She was granted a pardon in 2010 and is the first Canadian woman to be featured alone on a Canadian banknote. In December 1995, the House of Commons officially recognized February as Black History Month in Canada. Honorable Jean Augustine introduced a motion as the first black Canadian woman elected to Parliament. Black history is not just for black people. Black history is Canadian history. People approach situations with their own individual lens based on values, experiences, and opinions. We must assess our own bias and approach our individual willingness and readiness to truly acknowledge, honor, and empower those we perceive different than us, when in reality are more alike us. Where are you in your journey? So much to still learn, to think about, to share. Hello and welcome to Diverse Voices Unite. My name is Manon Heron, and I'm a teacher at St. Peter's Catholic Secondary School in Barrie. I have been passionate about this my whole life. Canadian Black history is important to me. I have been on a learning journey organizing various activities at the school level for almost 15 years. I couldn't let a pandemic disconnect us. Black History Month is a time to reflect on and value the many journeys, struggles, successes, and contributions of Black Canadians in our history. It's an opportunity to listen to one another, to share, to learn, to experience joy and possibly discomfort, to appreciate that diversity brings unity and that no one's voices, stories or experiences should ever be devalued or silenced. We can reflect on the past, connect in the present and inspire toward the future. This event will have shared voices from honorary guest speakers, local dignitaries, social justice committee students, performing artists, and community partners. I see myself as a facilitator of courageous conversations. So please join us and let the conversations begin. Before we begin, let us join in prayer. Please join me in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Most loving God, let us bring before you today our thanks, our praise, and our open hearts. We gather to honor Black History Month, to share the stories that are everywhere, but so often passed over. God of truth, instill in us the willingness to share our stories with our youth and others, not just today or this month, but every day throughout the year. 
God of justice, give us voice to reject the prejudices and move us to a place where we stand with those who struggle. God of peace, give us the strength and the perseverance needed to challenge the systems of racism wherever they exist so that we can clear a path for your justice, peace, and equity. God of love, teach us to lead with compassion and courage, to make better choices, and to love others as you love us. Amen. And St. Peter, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hi, I'm Mayor Jeff Lehman. Well, what does Black History Month mean to me? Well, this year in particular, it is a critical time for us as a broader community to hear the voices of our local and national uh, Black community to help understand the stories, um, the processes, the history, the personal experiences of systemic racism in our country, uh, and uh, also of the contributions of the Black community to lead to a greater understanding uh, of just how powerful the contribution of that community has been. I think the explosion of interest and awareness in systemic racism or of systemic racism that has uh, resulted in particular from the Black Lives Matter movement uh, needs to be carried in terms of uh, its momentum into Black History Month this year and in future years uh, as a focal point for telling stories uh, that help with a greater understanding among people who aren't part of the Black community of the unique uh, uh, systemic and individual factors uh, that are faced. Uh, but also, as I said, to celebrate uh, the incredible contributions, the champions, uh, the pioneers uh, who have led uh, the Black community in Canada. And uh, there's such a story to tell, right, from um, our area itself, uh, here in Simcoe County to across the country. Uh, I appreciate this year as well, it's a virtual event. And so thank you to the educators who are putting this together. Thank you to the organizers. Um, it is a very valuable, critically important contribution to our community, especially at this time. Thanks for allowing me to say a few words for Black History Month this year. I'm Harry Hughes, Mayor of Warren Medante. About 400 years ago, the first slave ship from Africa landed on the shores of America. This humble church was built by the descendants of what was then regarded as cargo. They made their way here years before the Underground Railway. This church, built more than 150 years ago, is a statement of a journey to freedom by having the rights to worship on their own, a right that has so long been denied. Oro Medante shares a deep sense of pride in this area being the first known place in the world where land grants were given regardless of ethnic origin. Keeping the word Oro in our township name connects it to the Black ancestral African homeland, Rio del Oro. It remains a testimony to a long history recognizing the strength and diversity. Many times this church has been rescued from the ravages of time from those who attempted to destroy it. With the help of people even beyond the boundaries of Canada, the building is now stronger than ever. So too is the story of what it represents. Each year, Black History Month shines a spotlight on this great human story, moving us closer and closer to true racial equality. It's a pretty unremarkable building. You'd be forgiven for driving past, as many do, giving it no more notice than you would perhaps to an old farm shed. Having served a purpose, its own builders even abandoned it more than a century ago, leaving it to decay and fate. But it was a community that built this church. It would be a community that would save it. Hello, my name is Kevin Frankish, and it's been my honor as a journalist to have documented some of the efforts and the results of this community effort to save the Oro African Church. 
I'm joined by Janie Cooper Wilson, a descendant of those who settled here in the early 19th century, many fleeing slavery in the United States today. She works tirelessly keeping their memory alive. And Sema Othman, who helped shepherd a massive crowdfunding effort to save this church. But first, let's find out more about this little log building that was witness to precious freedom. Janie, tell me about your relationship with the church and with this area of Ontario. Well, um, my three times great grandfather was one of the trustees of the Oral African Church. My two times great grandparents were married in the church in 1864. And I'm hoping, uh, actually, this past August 1st weekend, my beautiful daughter and her intended were planning on being married in the church, which made me just, you know, feel like jumping over the moon. (laughs) My arthritis (laughs) didn't stop me, but uh, you know, we had to cancel because of COVID. Um, It's a long history there. And, and I am descended on my mother's side to the oral settlement. And you are, every bit as important, if not more important than the history books, because a lot of our history from that time, from that church was never written down, but passed on from your great relatives right on down to you and to your kids. Well, there's a lot of us out here and, uh, you know, Rob Green is another. Uh, Now the way he uh, relates the stories is through his music and his songwriting, and each of us, um, you know, I just happened to be out front, not not necessarily by choice, it just, this is my calling, and, um, you know, working on the church project was just the highlight of my life. Um, I, I, I believe, and, and most African, uh, and, uh, you know, descendants believe, that if you honor the ancestors, they in turn will intercede for you and bless you. And believe me, anything that I did toward the the restoration of that church has come back tenfold. I am just so truly, truly blessed. Even up to last summer, I'm still finding descendants that had no idea. And to see their faces... Uh, I took a lady and her granddaughter there uh, to the grounds last summer. And the most amazing thing happened because in First Nations tradition, the butterfly means transition. And this lady had no idea 
uh, she was born, as the saying went, on the other side of the blanket. So she had no clue, uh, and her ancestry came out, you know, just by accident. And her, her daughter contacted me, and I knew exactly where she fit in. She's a bush for Othman's, uh, Salma's uh, benefit there. Uh, she's descended from uh, the Bush family. And while we were sitting under the big tree, the butterflies just started swarming all around me. And one lit in the palm of my hand. And I handed it to her. And it flew from my hand to hers. And she just, she just went to pieces. You know, but I see this type of thing all the time. And, and you know, for the establishment, it's hard to believe. But this is our ancestry. Take me back to you as a little girl. And do, do you recall a particular time, a particular story that stands out in your mind? Paint the picture for us. Oh, my. Well, since we're talking about the church, mm -hmm. as, as Sama can tell you, the... The history that's come down through, uh, you know, the, the history of Simcoe County is that the settlement was a humanitarian effort. Well, I guess from the white community's perspective, it was. Because we were the, you know, our people were the poor black people, you know. But it was not from our perspective. After our people were there for a while. It, it became, um, we were convenient. What happened when that settlement began? The blacks that fought in the War of 1812 were all centered around the Niagara District. Well, when the war was over, everybody was fighting for uh, payment for war losses, damage to their crops, damage to their homes, damage to their farms. And the, the government promised land grants. Well, up to 20 years after, the black men that fought and died and shed blood, they had to fight again to get what was due to them from the British Crown and the Canadian government. So, you know, the, the government at the time was being hit from all sides. And so they had to keep everybody happy. They couldn't deny that the black man fought. Uh, it's like the First Nation brothers that fought with the blacks and, and turned the tide at Queenston Heights. They're still fighting over the treaties because we were second class and third class citizens. Indeed, the, 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 the black soldiers received some land grants, but they were usually half of what a white soldier would get and usually in an area that wasn't great for farming. Well, exactly. And the white soldiers that were up in this area, up in the Midland area, they couldn't get their wives. They, you know, they didn't want to go out in the wilderness. So there were the black men saying, listen, we want land. We fought for it. We want what is just to, to us. Many applied but they, they, they still had to provide for their families. They still had to get their crops in. So a lot settled elsewhere. Those that did come here, it was a strategic position. Halfway between the garrison up in Midland and the, the uh, capital of York. We're learning more and more uh, as, as well. And, and, and we're sort of learning a more true account of history because at the time... Slavery was still a thing in Canada. It wasn't completely oh, yeah. abolished. It wasn't as bad as the U.S., but it was still there. There were still people fighting uh, to, to keep slavery alive. John Graves Simcoe had, had, had tried his best just to get it completely down and out abolished. So That wasn't going to happen. <laughs> and, just be, and just because they had made it to Canada didn't mean all their troubles were over, did it? Well, you would be amazed at the number of people, Kevin, today that do not know the difference between the, the British emancipation 
and the American emancipation. So, you know, many times I'd be standing outside that church and in the lectures that I do uh, over the years, they say, well, wh why, why were they afraid? Why, why were they afraid of, of slave catchers and all that? Because for that 30 years interim, the, the slave catchers, whether it was legal or not, could still come over that border and take our people back. Whether they were born free or not, and if in fact, they were born, if they were born of a, a former slave woman, the slave master could take them back. He considered them property, and that happened several exactly. times. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So you know, in all the black communities, vigilance committees were formed. If you saw, you know, a strange man in the area sniffing around. That word passed like wildfire. And that gave this church significance. There, yes. there, there was a need for this church, not just for the spiritual need of this community, but beyond that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the misconception about Night Watch, you know, in the history books, uh, you know, they talk about, people in their sleighs riding up in front of the church, listening to the black people singing and clapping and, and how, um, you know, the, the ministers were, it was Mr. 80 that would, would just get the spirit and, and would be as according to the history book, literally be climbing the walls. years, community members worked really hard to preserve and keep the church functional. In fact, in 2003, the church was designated as a national historical site by Parks Canada. Unfortunately, by 2014, the church was on the verge of collapsing. And unfortunately, the township of Ormidante had to close the church to the public. So with a very tight budget and uh, no alternate funding, the township did something very unconventional. And what we decided to do at the time was launch a GoFundMe campaign, which is a crowdfunding uh, campaign to raise money uh, that was needed to save the church. And in 2015, the GoFundMe campaign was launched with $140,000 as its goal. As part of the campaign, it was really important for the township to demonstrate the importance of the church and why we had to save it. To Janie's point, there's so much history, there's so many stories that needed to be shared. And really, the church is a symbol of Canada's strength and diversity. And it represents what people did to protect our religious rights and freedoms that we're so fortunate to have today. Janie is right that there, some people take this for granted. And I immigrated here from Egypt when I was two years old, so over 45 years ago. And I can tell you that I feel so blessed to be a Canadian. And I feel that we are so fortunate to have these religious rights and cultural freedoms that many other countries are not able to celebrate even today. So when I became involved with the church, I became very passionate about really sharing its story for its cultural significance and also to preserve the historical significance because there are many other beautiful stories that need to be shared about the church. So let's look at a timeline of this. And, and this was news. This, this uh, you know, CBC came and did a national story on the fundraising efforts. By the time we launched the crowdfunding campaign, a few months had passed and it received national and international attention. We raised $92,000 from donations from around the world. By May 2015, 
the township received provincial funding through the Trillium Fund in the amount of $121,000, with $27,000 going to the Vaughan African Canadian Association to publish a children's book that they can use as part of their curriculum. By 2015, we received federal funding in the amount of $77,000 from Parks Canada, with many other donations in kind. So the story of the church really impacted people and people wanted to help in any way possible. So your goal for the crowdfunding campaign was $140,000. What ended up being raised altogether? We raised um, over $200,000. So we ended up closing the crowdfunding campaign early. And any of the extra money that was raised was put into a reserve fund that would help with the future maintenance and management of the church. In fact, after we closed the crowdfunding campaign, many other donations continued to come in because people really wanted to feel like they were a part of the church and make a contribution to help save it. In fact, we received a donation that um, meant a, a lot to me because it really validated the importance of the church. And it came from a student, a history student who only had $5 in his bank account. And he said, this is the last bit of money I have, but I'm a history student. I think it's really important that we share these stories and keep history alive and donated his last $5 to the church. And we also got donations from atheists. So this church really resonated with people whether regardless of their cultural backgrounds, their religious backgrounds. And again, it stands as a true testament of what this has been all about. So it definitely made an impact. Yes. So by August 2016, we held a grand reopening. Hundreds of people from around the world attended. It brought descendants together. It brought people who didn't even know they were related or connected together. And it was so heartfelt. It was warming. We had the Lieutenant Governor General there speaking. And it was just remarkable. Tell me about the recognition and the awards it's received. The township received Provincial and Historical Association Awards for the preservation of the church and community leadership. It was the first project to ever receive two awards in the same year by the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. It's interesting, too. We had Lieutenant Governor John Graves Simcoe, uh, you know, in the 1790s and into 1800, who was working to abolish slavery outright, and he met up with resistance, but he worked so hard. And now we have today's Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, uh, Elizabeth Dowdswell, who also is taking an active interest in the community. I will leave you with the quote by the Lieutenant Governor about the church. The church is at the heart of many stories fundamental to Ontarians and Canadians. It is a story of community and neighbors coming together to preserve the church. And it's a story of freedom and equality. Janie, final words. Learn, see, understand. If people see the church, go to the church to visit the church, and actually take the time to absorb the essence of those walls and the grounds that they're walking on, because they are walking over the ancestors. Allow their essence to come into their, their being and, and see others, not for the color of their skin, but as Dr. King said, for the content of their character. That church and everything that it opens up for humanity brings so much healing, but the person has to be ready to accept that. Thank you both, Janie and Sama, for sharing. Some final words. This time, we got lucky. This important part of the history of Oromodonte, Barrie, and Canada as a whole nearly disappeared from existence. We are all now stewards of this church, no matter what race. And I don't mean stewards of the wood and the nails, but of what it was built for 
what it still stands for, and who built it, a community that knows the true meaning of precious freedom. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Katrina Matera and I'm a former graduate of St. Peter's Secondary High School. My piece today tells the story of Harriet Tubman and her mission to free the slaves using the Underground Railroad. In my piece, I've chosen to try and demonstrate Harriet's strength and perseverance in her journey through creative movement and storytelling and I really hope you guys enjoy. Hi, my name is Valentina. I'm a grade 11 student from St. Peter's and Barrie. And to me, Black History Month means celebrating and understanding Black heritage and all the important figures who have made an impact in Black history. But most importantly, it means educating myself and being aware of that history. You know, it's very easy for us to just say we know enough without having actual sufficient knowledge of the past. Being aware and spreading that awareness is definitely one of the most important things we can do. But it starts with us talking about it and having those meaningful conversations about the past so we can make an even bigger impact in the future. It's necessary for us to learn more, not just for ourselves, but for the younger ones as well who pay attention to everything going on. Speaking from experience, I have three younger siblings between the ages of 8 and 11, and they're constantly asking me difficult questions like, why did it take so long for people to realize having slaves was bad? Or why is it such a big deal for people to have different skin colors? I want to be able to answer those questions, not just to satisfy their curiosity, but answer those questions properly so that when they get older, they're able to educate others and continue the process. You know, we teens have the ability to influence our youth so much but it starts with us to be curious and have those important conversations. This is John Broussard, Member of Parliament for Barry Innisfil. February is Black History Month, and I'd like to thank Men and Heron and the entire team at St. Peter's for inviting me to send this message. Since 1995, the House of Commons has recognized February as Black History Month. However, the gratitude our nation owes to the contributions and sacrifices of Black Canadians goes back for centuries. Here in Simcoe County, there was no European agricultural settlement until after 1819. Daniel Coakley, one of the earliest black settlers in Oro Medante at the time, was a critical part in surveying the region alongside farmer and politician Samuel Wilmot. Within the black community of Simcoe County, the African Methodist Episcopal Church was host to congregations from across the region. The first black minister was Reverend R.S.W. Sorek, who served until 1847. Despite these good news stories of history, we know that African people were at one point enslaved throughout the territory that is now Canada. We also know that over many centuries, black communities fought enslavement and helped to establish the diverse cultural fabric that makes Canada strong today. To me, black history means a reflection of black contribution, culture, and resilience. 
It's not lost on me that just the other week our country paid tribute to the Honorable Lincoln Alexander, the first black member of parliament and lieutenant governor who continues to be a trailblazer that inspires our communities through his legacy. As your member of parliament, it's part of my duty and responsibility to ensure that our diverse communities across the region come together and celebrate the richness of our different cultures, which makes Barry Innisfil a place for everyone. This month, as we celebrate Black history, let's honor the Black Canadians that came before us and pledge to build a more equitable and prosperous Canada. Thank you, everyone, and happy Black History Month. First, let me introduce, this is uh, Auntie Janelle, my son, Johanse, and uh, my name is Kwame. And uh, we're going to talk today a little bit about uh, African drums in the diaspora. Of course, drums are not the only African instrument, but they are one of the most important instruments to people from the African continent, right? And so Yohatsi is going to hold out the bass drum, Janelle's going to hold out the bell, and I want you to uh, participate. So find a stick, something that you can knock with, you can clap your hands, and together we're going to make some calypso music today. Boom, beam, boom, 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 beam, boom. You got that? Yeah. Boom, boom, beam. Keep going, nice. Now you, uh, you, I want you. Some people, I want you to clap, clap on the beat. Okay, clap, clap on the beat, clap, clap, and all of you with last names. From M to Z, you're going to play with Auntie Janelle. Thinking, 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 thinking. Now we're going to put it all together with the conga and the tinto. Salaman wule, say no more, no more, nana sala. Say no more, no more, nana sala, nana sala, say nani na na nanu. Every time I sing the song, I think of an African woman who goes down to the seashore to get the sea god to return her son, who has been taken by the slave traders on the big boat to somewhere she never knows. She goes down daily asking the sea god to return her son and he never returns and she never sees him again. Slave's blood runs through my veins Every once in a while I feel his pain Cross the border to be free. My grandfather carried me. Elias, can you be me? Elias, can you see me? Elias, can you see what you become? What you ship of sorrows. When the boats landed, they landed in uh, South America, they landed in the Caribbean, and they also landed in the United States, which began my ancestors' journey from slavery. There were various trade routes, various slave routes uh, throughout the United States, coming up from the southern states all the way through New York and Pennsylvania and uh, Chicago and that sort of thing, up to um, Canada. The people left 
because they realized the atrocities that were happening to them. Family separations, my husband and wife and children were separated, and thank God that doesn't happen nowadays, right? There was a rock that was planted on top of uh, the slave trader. This, this, is, uh, this particular rock was the one that um, was in Virginia. And the, the slaves would stand on top of this rock to be sold into slavery. Sometimes they would be in the nude, sometimes barely clothed. The uh, slave owners and slave uh, people would uh, go in and inspect them. They'd look in their mouths and, and uh, in their ears, make sure that they were fine stock, treated just like buying a horse. On the plantation, the, they were beaten if they misbehaved. And it uh, didn't matter what they did or how they tried to appease their slave owners, they were still beaten. And if a person decided, that, hey, I'm going to run away and I'm going to try to keep away from this particular thing, they would beat them. The slave owner would order that a slave be beat um, sometimes uh, 38 lashes because at that particular time, 39 was known to have killed the, the individual, but the, they would stop at 38, just uh, one lash before death. Slave trading was very, very lucrative back then, and uh, everybody realized that uh, money was the name of the game. Thank God it's not today, again. But there was a movement, an anti-slavery movement that started, and uh, they realized that uh, there was inhumane for these people to be traded in such a manner. Uh, there was the Fugitive Slave Act in 1850, which said that uh, if anybody ran away, if the slaves had run away and that sort of thing, that uh, they could be returned uh, by uh, bounty hunters. And so bounty hunters were sent all through the United States to try to bring these people back. They actually even went to Canada to uh, illegally transport people back to uh, Canada, uh, back to the United States and back to the plantation owners. One of the uh, heroes of that particular era was a lady by the name of Harriet Tubman. And I believe my ancestors came up with uh, Harriet Tubman through the Underground Railroad. They come up through uh, Buffalo uh, and to uh, uh, Niagara Falls, uh, through St. Catharines. And in St. Catharines, uh, there was a, a church dedicated to Harriet Tubman, actually on Geneva Street. And I got an opportunity to visit that particular place uh, a couple of years ago and, and visit this church there where Harriet Tubman had uh, deposited some of the, the slaves that she had uh, helped get to freedom. There's another person by the name of Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass was a, a self-taught uh, person who uh, taught himself how to read and he was a great orator and he was a great uh, instrument of God in bringing these slaves across into uh, Canada. The emancipation of the slaves um, took place in 1863 with the Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln, and uh, they moved uh, forward. My ancestors actually came up through Niagara Falls, uh, through St. Catharines, uh, Hamilton, and uh, through to Burlington, that sort of thing. To, now, one thing I noticed that um, as I was looking at the final terminal on the, on the Underground Railroad, which is Owen Sound, which is where I'm from, I noticed that uh, there were black people deposited uh, in St. Catharines, in Hamilton, in Burlington, uh, Collingwood. Collingwood had a huge settlement, and finally in Owen Sound. In Owen Sound, there was a man by the name of uh, F Father Miller. Father Miller was a, quite a respected, well-respected man in uh, Owen Sound. He was a minister, and he started a church called Little Zion, and he built it in the bush, and it was basically a log cabin. Uh, he was well respected by the not only the black people, but the white people of the town, too, because he was a devout Christian person. And uh, he had started the Emancipation Celebration Picnic, which was started uh, 155 years plus ago, and it still runs to this day. Another person in that particular time was uh, Daddy Hall. Daddy Hall was a 
town crier and he had a bell and he would ring in the streets of Owen Sound. And he didn't, there was no newspapers, it was just uh, Daddy Hall who was given the news of that particular day and he'd ring, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye, and he would uh, tell people about the, uh, the news of that particular day. My family tree, uh, three different families, uh, the uh, Earlses, the Woodses, and the Greens. Um, Elias Earls married um, uh, Louisa Douglas and started that one branch. Uh, they had a son by the name of Solomon who married a lady from England. Yes, and she was white. And can you imagine what that would be like in the 1860s? A black man marrying a white woman at that particular time. And they had uh, children uh, from that particular marriage. And the other one was uh, John Green who when he came across the border, changed his name to John Green. Uh, his original name was Staten because the uh, slaves at that particular time, they took the name of the slave owner. And when he came across the border, he changed it to John Green. And uh, so those are the three strands of the uh, family. One lady that is really well known is in our family is Aunt Jemima. This is my great grandmother. And she lived to be 107 years old. And uh, she was born in 1843 and she died in 1949. One particular story that uh, is told uh, by my mother who actually lived with Aunt Jemima, my great grandmother. Uh, the uh, town sheriff came to uh, uh, kick her off the land and uh, she said, because she didn't pay the taxes for that particular year. And so my grandmother, great grandmother, she said, step across that line. And uh, so the sheriff, who was you know, six foot three and 250 pounds of solid muscle, stepped across the line. And my grandmother, who was five foot tall, if that, and 100 pounds soaking wet, grappled him to the ground, put the boots to him, and beat him up. And needless to say, the sheriff left uh, hobbling away. Very strong woman. Solomon Earls married uh, uh, Sarah Earls, Sarah Woods. And they had uh, kids at that particular time. Can you imagine, though, just being married to a, a white woman at that particular time? This is 1860s, 1870s. And uh, obviously, she was uh, disowned by her family and, and uh, never got to be with her family again. And, but that didn't matter because I guess the love was strong. But unfortunately, uh, Solomon Earls got blown up in a, in a mine uh, uh, well, it's actually a quarry right around their house. And this is a funeral scene where we're seeing uh, Sarah, my great-great-grandmother, yeah, with all her children around her. And uh, in 1906, uh, he died. This is my grandparents, Granny Green and Granny, Granddad uh, Green. And they were a loving couple. And they had 15 children. And this is the house that they lived in at a particular time. Uh, most people look at this house and see it as a ramshackled uh, building. But uh, it was a, uh, a soda factory or a pickle factory. I'm not too sure which, because uh, there's various stories about it. But they had 15 children in this home, in this house, and they grew, grew up in this house. But I'll tell you one thing. When you walked in the door, my mother, my grandmother, she had uh, cookies and ginger ale for all of this. And there was always love in that particular thing, and it, uh, it was an incredible place. My granddad, he had a pot belly stove in the center of the, uh, in the, center of the uh, house, and uh, he kept it going winter, summer, spring, and fall. And uh, invariably, uh, there wasn't too many cousins that weren't burnt on that particular uh, pot belly stove. This is my mother and my father. My father was in the service. He went four and a half years over in Germany and England. And uh, he wrote very uh, lovely letters to my, my mother at that particular time. Love letters. And always with a P.S. Please send a Mickey a whiskey, which my mother would try to do. Most people ask me, why do you do black history? Why do you talk about black history? Well, there's an old saying, if you know where you're coming from, you know where you're going to. He says, uh, this is a picture of me and my, my two boys, uh, Christopher and Aaron. And I wanted them to know what their heritage was, what it, what it was like for them 
uh, to know where they came from and, uh, and therefore know where they're going to. Uh, and that's why I do black history. One of the major things I really like about uh, this is uh, the family, the Green family, the Earls family, and the Woods' family that, you know, participated in forming me. And uh, when you really, really think about it, there was one particular person that really uh, hit a strong note me in, that was Barack Obama. Barack Obama became the 44th president of the United States. Can you imagine that? From slavery to the president of the United States, the most powerful man in the world. I hope you enjoyed this presentation, and uh, hopefully you get some questions that you can ask me as we go through the uh, question and answer period. And with that, it concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Kaya Francois, a student from St. Peter's Catholic Secondary School. Black History Month is really important to me as a way to honor and recognize my Black heritage. Hi, my name is Ella Samuel Unguli, and I am a student of St. Peter's Catholic Secondary School. Black History Month is important to me because it is a celebration of my Black history and looking back on how hard our ancestors have fought to triumph over racial inequality and overcome racial injustice. Hi, my name is Oniechi, and I am stu a student from St. Peter's Catholic Secondary School. Black History Month is important to me because it is the time to recognize the achievements of Black people over the years and how they contributed to our present society. So today we are presenting a dramatic reading of a poem called The Phoenix Rising. We live in a world that is burning, where men and women in power have used their authority to take all that is right and just to nothing more than a pile of simmering ash. We can choose to live within the destruction or we can choose to be a phoenix rising. We live in a world that is burning, a world that no longer wants to hear men call out to their mothers as they struggle to breathe. I want to hear mothers from depths of despair cry as they hear that your daughter in her own home did die. We no longer wish to set the world where a young black man dies of asphyxiation and whose death slipped quietly into obscurity, throwing a sandwich was the most serious crime. For you and me, why is this moment not etched in time? Or to another young man who played violin to stray cats, but in less than a minute his music was silenced because the powers above believed a threat he must be. First he was choked, then with ketamine injected. How is this right? We must stand connected. We live in a country that claims to be nice, but if you're a person of color, that can indeed be a price. It's not blatantly violent like the states of the South, but vile comments indeed break through the veneer. This is the moment to stand and be bold, recognizing that everyone comes from the same mold. No person should be judged for the color you see, but for the heart that beats within, strong, steady, and free. Let the color of our skin only provide depth to the tapestry of mankind. And when you see us in the streets, stop viewing us as different in your mind. We live in a world that is burning. Let the ashes from past generations provide us with strength and courage in this modern landscape to share the stories of our ancestors, the ones that our world did shape. All we ask is for you to hear us. Don't ignore the cacophony of voices that are raised in melodious symphony. Set aside what you think you know and just be. This moment is the precipice that together we can climb. For when our future becomes our present and our present becomes our past, where will you be residing? On which side of history will you stand? In this moment, what righteousness will you demand? We live in a world that is burning, enveloped in coals beneath simmering ash. We can choose to live within the destruction, or we can choose to be a phoenix rising, spreading wings and magnificent glory to take flight and soar into future where it is clear and bright. The world may be burning. The world may be burning. The world may be burning. 
but the phoenix does rise. Hi, I'm Doug Shipley, your member of parliament for Barrie, Springwater, Oromodonte. Black History Month, for me, is a time to reflect on the early diversity of our region. Oromodonte is home to the historical site of the Oro African Church that was built in 1847 as part of an early black Canadian settlement. The site stands today as a testament to the diversity of early settlers in Simcoe County and is an important piece of the history of our region. This is time to reflect on the struggles that have been faced by black Canadians and a time to celebrate the great strides and important contributions that have been made. It is also important to acknowledge that there is still much work to be done to achieve equality and ask ourselves what we can personally do to affect change. Hi, I'm Serena and I'm a grade 11 student at St. Pete's in Barrie. Black History Month has always been a time of learning, appreciating, and reflecting on where we are currently and why. For me, it's always been a time where I can finally see people who look like me being put in the spotlight for positive and impactful changes they've made. I know I'm not alone when I say that as a young black female, sometimes my voice feels a little bit like background noise. If you agree and you've ever felt silenced, then I encourage you to use your voice to educate people on the oppression that people of color have faced and continue to face every single day. Educating people is key to making well-rounded opinions without feeling pressured because of your family or your race or the party that you like. Without this knowledge, it's so easy to be manipulated into thinking that, oh, oppression ended when slavery ended, or I have to think this. This is what my party stands for, so this is all I can think. If you see yourself being for these changes that society is making, then use your voice to educate people that have similarities as you or no similarities at all. Throughout history, I've seen a lot of news and society reactions on things that they really hadn't thought about before it trended. And I consider this super trend-like because now everyone feels the need to make woke and wordy opinions on stuff that they really hadn't thought of before. It's really comforting to see that everyone wants to clarify that they're not racist, but being not racist and being anti-racist are two different things. We can start improving by making sure that we're using our words carefully and remembering that these harmless comments really do impact people. These compliments such as microaggressions like, oh, you're so smart for a black person, or you speak such good English, aren't actually compliments. And you can't really say, I can't be racist, I have black friends. It's just not good enough anymore because it doesn't matter who you're friends with. It matters how are you supporting them. You know, how are you a friend to them or an ally, which means that we have to be promoting kindness, checking up on our loved ones, and using our voice in a powerful way that doesn't tear anybody down. Teen leaders can make positive changes, and we should advocate not because it's trendy or popular, but because it's the right thing to do. My name is Shay. My name is Erica. We are gathered today to celebrate and acknowledge the contributions made by our African community. I believe it is especially important for us to gather this year in light of our current uncertainty and global divide. As my father always said, what we don't see when we start to separate by color is how much we really have in common. Today we will be singing the song Better Place by Aaron Lee and it is about the importance of laying down bias, distrust, and how we are all in this together. If we just give peace a chance, we can free our mind from all the pain, the quest for gain. Together we will find that everyone has a part, has a role to play. Open your hearts, that's a start to a brighter day. We can make the world a better place. We can make the world a better place. Make the world a better place. Peace is a 
tree, let it grow, grow and bear its fruit for you and for me, for all the world to see that everyone has a part, has a role to play. Open your heart, that's a start. To a brighter day, we can make the world a better place. We can make the world a better place. We can make the world a better place. We can make the world a I believe that we can, I know that we can, I hope that I can, a beauty of Hi, my name is Doug Downey. I'm the member of Provincial Parliament for Barry Springwater Ormadante, and I'm also the Attorney General of Ontario, the Chief Law Officer for, for the government. And Black History Month is so important, and it recognizes the importance of the Charter and everybody being treated equally before the law and under the law and with regard to government. One of the really impressive people that has served in so many capacities is Lincoln Alexander. He's known as The Link. And he was the first black member of federal parliament and the first black member of federal cabinet. He went on to become the lieutenant governor of Ontario from 1985 to 1991. He was a lawyer before that, so he understood the rule of law and the importance of, of equal rights. And, and he promoted equal rights and youth and seniors issues. And it is just critical that we learn our history, that we understand the important role of the rule of law and something that I'm very proud of that we do here in Ontario. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today for this amazing event. My name is Aaron Redpath and I'm gonna be one of your speakers for today. So just a quick introduction into who I am. Um, I'm 28 years old, born in 1992. I was born to a Jamaican father and Canadian mother. I was born here in Scarborough, Ontario. Um, I grew up in Scarborough as well as in Ajax and something I always loved to do from early on was play sports and so sports was has always been a huge part of my life and that's that's a route that I chose to follow so upon graduating from high school from Jay Clark Richardson and Ajax I decided that I would take a basketball scholarship opportunity to go to McMaster University once I went to McMaster University I was able to study kinesiology which is something I was very intrigued by, very interested in, because it was kind of right up my alley. It was sports. It was something that I already had developed a passion for. So for me, it was it was the right route to take. And I enjoyed my five years at McMaster. And during this time at McMaster, I was able to realize just how much more diverse uh, the, the university was than necessarily my high school, just that many more people, all different kinds of races coming, all international students, local students, and it was really amazing opportunity for me to really see and expand my, my knowledge and ex just expand my life experience as an individual going to McMaster. And this allowed me to continue to, to push forward in school, but also the opportunity to really take that next uh, step in my basketball career. And growing up from young, like, like we all do, we all have our dreams to, to play in the NBA, play professionally. This was something that, that I really wanted to do. So upon graduating from McMaster University, I was able to secure a contract in Spain 
for my for my rookie professional season and that kind of allowed me to get my foot into the door and allowed me to go on and, and pursue my professional career that I had always dreamed of and had always worked towards and so this was a very exciting opportunity for me but at the same time it was very scary and going not knowing the language of the country you're going to live in not knowing anybody there only having the common ground of basketball um, that was kind of something I, I chose to, to pursue and follow and I couldn't be happier because of the life experience it gave me and as I said it allowed me to get my foot in the door into the professional basketball world which further allowed me to, to travel around the world, meet new people, have new experiences but also allowed me to continue for a four-year career play the sport that I love. So now that you know a little bit more about me, I kind of just wanted to enlighten you on what it was like for me growing up in my family. And so as I mentioned, my mother was Canadian, my father's Jamaican. And uh, what I noticed about growing up in, a, in our Jamaican family right off the bat was that we were very, very diverse and very multicultural. You can notice this by showing up to one of our family events and you would just go in and you would notice people um, obviously different skin tones, different skin variations, but also of different ethnicities. So we had Lebanese Jamaicans, Chinese Jamaicans, white Jamaicans, tons of, of people that, and when you open your eyes, you realize like, wow, this is all Jamaicans, but it's very, it's very diverse and it's very eye-opening. And so to me growing up with that, I was always accustomed to just, I, for me as an individual, if you look at me, People off the bat are not going to be able to tell, oh, he's he's mixed with black. I've gotten a lot of things over the years. People thought I've been Mexican. I was Jewish. I was Arab. People thought I was just white. There's just a whole lot of things that were really eye-opening to me as an individual being multicultural, being biracial. Um, I think that it was very important for me to, to grow up in, in the family that I did to really realize how much out there there is in the world and how diverse we truly are. And growing up in, in Toronto, obviously, we, we hang our hat on being multicultural and being being open to everybody, and which is, which is a great thing because what happens with, with cultures and whatnot is once you, you live together in multiple cultures, start coming together you begin to adapt certain uh, things from that culture so you might you might see how one culture we'll talk about cuisine let's say let's say uh, my favorite food in the world is jerk chicken and so anytime we would go out to, to family events there would be uh, of course the Jamaican cuisine there but then have it complemented by other places people cooking from places of their their cultural background and just being able to to taste foods from other cultures. We, we wouldn't be blessed to, to ha try something simple as, as a food from a different culture if we didn't all have immigrants come in from years past and our ancestors come in and sell in, in one place, right? If we were to, to grow up and, and only know one cuisine or only know one culture, we would be very stuck and, and set in ways. So I think diversity is huge just in if you have an open mind and understanding that there is a lot of, of benefits that can come from just learning from other individuals, learning from other cultures, implementing it, and just, just um, living life with kind of that, that open mind. A huge part of, of Black History Month to me is just being thankful and being grateful for the sacrifices that people made before us 
to be able, for us to be able to live the lives that we do now. There are, there are a lot, and, and this is one thing I would always do is at uh, family events, family gatherings, we would talk about stories or I would hear some stories from my grandma or, or my grandfather or just aunts and uncles, just, just stories about what it was like leaving Jamaica to come over here or what it was like growing up for them and, and all the hard work and hard labor that they had to do to be able to, to sacrifice, come over here to kind of help us have a better life. And that goes back generations and generations. And it's very important that I think during Black History Month, but also every month, I think it's important to just be cognizant, which means you're just aware, just, be, just have the mental awareness that there are a lot of battles that we never had to fight today. And we are still fighting our own battles, but there are a lot of battles we, ha we don't have to fight today because of those who came before us. And so Black History Month to me is, is a great time to just sit back and, and take it in and, and just be thankful that we are blessed to be able to live the lives that we do now based on the sacrifices from our ancestors and, and from the generations prior to us. Growing up um, in high school and elementary school, Black History Month was a great opportunity for me to, and, and the school to really go down to assemblies and go down and watch um, performances, whether it was theatrical performances or, or dancing or a hip hop routine or um, rapping or anything of, of that sort. Um, it was a great opportunity for anybody that didn't know or wasn't aware of black culture or wasn't really in it. It was a great opportunity for them to learn, but it's also a great opportunity to celebrate. And that's that's really what Black History Month um, was meant to me growing up, was able to, to, to celebrate and, and have a fun kind of unwind from school, detach from school, but get down with, with everybody and, and just laugh and, and enjoy the, the performance we were watching. And another huge um, celebration that they have in, in Canada and Toronto every summertime is Carabana. And my family's always made it a point to go down to Carabana and just have fun. We, we always have a good time with it because it's always good music and, and fun. There's dancing, good food from all over different places. And it, it's so diverse. Everybody from the city goes down there just to celebrate and, and be, be all together, be as one people. And that's, I want to leave off with a Jamaican model. And it, it is out of many, one people. And I think this is, it's so true and it's so, it's so accurate in the sense for, for me personally, growing up in, in the family that I did and having the upbringing that I did, I understand this completely just because of how diverse my family is, how different we all look, yet we're all the same. And I think Caravana sums that up as well as no matter what, we're all from different West Indian backgrounds, different Caribbean backgrounds. You might not even be from the Caribbean. It doesn't matter. It's 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 diverse. Everybody's welcome to Caravana. Everybody comes down and has a great time. And we're all there as one people just celebrating human life, celebrating greatness, celebrating the differences in all of us and appreciating and just having fun with it. And so... For, for you all listening, I just want to say thank you for, for taking the time to hear me out. And I just want you to take away that you should always ask questions because asking questions shows that you're willing to learn. And that is huge in, in advancing in today's society is ask your questions, meet people, talk to people, and learn from people. Because learning is going to give you the wisdom that you need to carry forward and will help you have a brighter future. So thank you all for hearing me, and I appreciate it. Have a good day. Hi everyone, my name is Jamie Turner. I am the founder of Boomboxers Crew, and my mission is to help people find self-release through the hip-hop culture. Impressions, this is hard. Whoa, watch your soul, don't let go. Comes step for you. Don't make sure that it comes in too. Let me find my door. Let me find my peace. Open up my wing. I've been no runs to see. But when we run team, can't draw it on the track. Oh, mm -hmm.
kids on a child A song on a samurai Loyal to the day I die When it's be exhausted Can't feel the wind They feeling like they lost it While the true loser complaining That he never got it don't be mad like a wise guy like me might listen If my reaction is faster than something that you missing On a long path you can feel your own wrath Consumed by the mind's fuel It's only a matter of time before death Find you I'll never care for it Never care for the drama I'll never stare for it Never be here for the drama play. Hi, Andrea Kanjan here, MPP for Barry Innisfil. Black History Month is an opportunity for us to reflect on our history here in Canada and in our own backyard in Simcoe County and the contributions of Black Canadians. For instance, you can look at the War of 1812 when Canada fought the Americans for our, um, our sovereignty and there were many Black soldiers that uh, fought in that war. As a thank you for their sacrifices and their contributions, the Canadian government gave them land, none other than here in Simcoe County, in Oro Medante. And to this day, you can visit that historic site. It is um, at the Oro African Methodist Apostolical Church, where it uh, is now a national historic site uh, of Canada. And of course, it brings tourists from all around the world and our regions to learn about the Black history and, of course, the settlement of those Black uh, Canadians. We are very blessed in our riding to have so many leaders in the Black community who are contributing so much every day. And Black History Month is an opportunity to reflect on the past, the present, and our bright future. Because in diversity, we triumph and we strengthen as a community. Hey guys, and happy Black History Month. I am Shaq of Shaq's World, and we are here today inside Shaq's World Community Center. What does Black History Month mean to me? Black History Month is the one month a year where we can get together and create a safe space for very important conversations with our friends, families, and neighbors. Black History Month is also the opportunity to learn about all the triumphs and accomplishments that Black people have had over the years. It's also the opportunity to look further into your history and learn about things that happened before slavery and learn about how Black people start off as royalty. Black History Month, to me, it's a very important time of year for us to get to know our roots and to get to know where we come from. Our mission at Shaq's World is to create a safe space for youth through sports, innovation, and community engagement. Past year we've got the opportunity to create representation in our community in a way that has never been seen before and we hope to continue to provide that safe space for conversations. Hey, I'm Errol Lee and I'm the founder of Karen Concerts. Karen Concerts are organized to provide youth with innovative, creative, and interactive concert presentations specifically designed to teach, nurture, and model positive behavior, building character, confidence, and self-esteem. Ultimately, we encourage youth to develop into kind, respectful, and caring young people. We're happy to be honoring Black history with you and to be a part of this caring community in Barrie. Hi, my name is Ella and I'm a student of St. Peter's Catholic Secondary School, currently in grade 11. I am overjoyed to be a part of this B2 assembly and be given the opportunity to voice my opinions as a young black girl. Black History Month is a special celebration for all people of black and African descent. It is the time to reflect on our dreadful pasts, not to be filled with agony, but to rejoice how hard our ancestors have fought to triumph over racial inequality. As it represents our struggles, resilience, and our victory, it gives us hope that things will continue to change for the better in the future if we keep on fighting. As the name states, Black History Month is a reminder of our Black history, our ancestral background, and learning to appreciate ourselves as Black, beautiful, strong, and powerful. Today we see Black youth and youth of other descent speaking up on Black issues and how important it is to end racism. Well, this is just the beginning. 
In the near future, I declare a vast decrease in police brutality, especially against black people. We shall not comply and be quiet to excuses such as he may have been holding a hairbrush, but I'm justified because I thought it was a gun in his hands. Absolutely no racially induced crimes shall be accepted. They shall all get justice. We will work towards this future by working with community members as it allows people to view things from a black person's perspective and understand our feelings about cultural appropriation, systematic racism, and so much more. And create a safe, healthy environment for black people to live in. Things that black people have been insulted for, like their hair, skin, the way they talk, and different aspects of their culture, have been appropriated by other races, specifically the new generation. It is very alarming how things that people mocked to suddenly trendy. This also applies to other people's cultures that is also being borrowed, but when they voice their discomfort in how things are, they are silenced and made to feel like they are overreacting. And at the end of the day, their voice doesn't really matter, they are just told that. This is exactly how anti-oppression affects everyone. Anti-oppression includes people who experience oppression and people who experience privilege. In particular, having privilege means people who experience advantages in the world based on their identities. Throughout history, black people have been segregated and forced into slavery by white people's laws. So it can be said that white people have been privileged over black people for a very long time. As times change, we need to accept this fact, sympathize and understand where black people are coming from. It is not enough to just listen, but help speak on racism and stopping the discrimination of black people once and for all is a huge contribution to our legacy and as we all wish for greater heights. Thank you. Hi, I'm Michelle Newton, creator of Our Mosaic Lives, keynote speaker on the intersectionality of being a black woman and co-founder of a not-for-profit called Making Change. In February for Black History Month, it's really a time to put black people, black culture and the issue of anti-black racism back into the conversation. For me personally, it's a time to celebrate black Canadian women and girls and the other black people and the community in my life. It's a chance to shine a light on what it's like living while black in Simcoe County and to motivate change through conversations, inspire action and raise awareness of systemic racism. We do this work all year round because we're black 365 days a year. The organization Making Change I co-founded in 2019 and in the summer of 2020 we became incorporated our primary focus is starting conversations and discussion around inclusion and diversity, but with a specific focus on Black people, Black culture, Black community, and educating about issues on anti-Black racism and how to be an ally. Our work has allowed us to do uh, making change presentations in the schools. Uh, we work in the community when we have the opportunity to have a community celebration event. We raise awareness in the business community of what it's like to be a black woman in business or a black man in business. And we recently launched an educational program on anti-black racism for organizations to work on becoming more inclusive and recognize systemic anti-black racism in their organizations. Our Mosaic Lives is a passion project. It's an ongoing thread for me since 2018. And it's really focused on my personal journey that I call Back to Black. It's understanding where I fit in as a biracial black person in this world that I live in and making the world a better place for my daughter who's growing up. It's really the intersection of being black and woman. I have community conversations on inclusion and diversity with different members of the community from different diverse backgrounds to talk about what they're doing and how we can encourage you to become more inclusive. At the end of the day, collaborating is one of the keys to all of our success and our ability to be better together lies in each of us beginning a learning journey. I invite you to do that during Black History Month, but at the end of February, please keep that journey going. Thanks for listening. Hello everyone, my name is Shelley Skinner. I'm the founder and president of Uplift Black. Uplift Black is working to increase the socioeconomic and the overall wellness of Black people living in Simcoe and Muskoka. Our work is hyper-local, and we are anchored in community engagement, mentorship, and advocacy. Black History Month is all about celebrating the past and truth-telling. Uplift Black is about the future, the future of our community. Help us achieve the ultimate goal of racial equity through a conscious community. To find out more, visit www.upliftblack.com.
www.blackhistorymonth.org. Thank you. Happy Black History Month. Can you divide yourself? Can you decide for yourself? In a moment where, in past circumstances, you could have been more. Can you be brave? Can you work on trying to be the best you you can be? I'm trying. Are you? Are you making mistakes? I know I am. But I'm striving to be great. And one day we all could be. Are you ready? Circumstances where a human being may look like you or may not. And they've been the target of someone else. Maybe this is something you've seen before. And you thought to yourself, whoa, that was weird. Or should someone be thinking, talking, acting like that to someone? Chances are, if you ask the questions, you want the answers to. Action in the home, you can't condone. Blind eyes or no disguise. Action in the streets, action in the news. Do you know your inaction speaks? So just for a moment, I was proud of you. But we have been forgetting one key component. To eradicate the enemy, you must make your mind clear. To bear thoughts of an opponent makes your future harder to steer. Eyes on the road, look ahead, and if you see that a soul's hit, check to see if they're okay. Don't just nod and say, yeah, yeah, okay. Acknowledging your responsibility to make sure humans connect through all different people's types of experiences can build a better tomorrow. Working on yourself to rid ignorance and flaws takes patience. Making sure the ground that you walk on is incarcerated with your peace. Honesty reveals truth. Conversation plants the seeds. And diverse voices unite. Thank you for the conversations. Thank you to the guest speakers, dignitaries, social justice committee students, performing artists, staff at St. Peter's, and the many community partners for their contributions. Special thanks to the City of Barrie, Amanda Dyke and Stephanie Schlitzter, Rogers TV, Ron Clark and Kevin Kelly, Melissa Oliver, the video producer, Jamie Turner, my sounding board, Janie Cooper Wilson for reminding me not to sweat the small stuff, and to my mother for her undying support in all that I do. Let us work together and focus on our similarities. I challenge us all to look to people for who they are versus what they do and or the color of their skin. Do not assume, learn to understand. Do not isolate, instead collaborate. Movements of change shouldn't be a trend, but an attitude and behavior shift. This isn't a choice, it's our responsibility. Multicultural Canada was built off of immigrants, settlers, and descendants. And what a diverse, creative country Canada is. We must do this together and not alone. As diverse voices unite. Oh!